Today, I'm talking to author, scholar, and former Army Ranger, Lieutenant Colonel Dave Grossman, about his life study into the psychology of killing and what led him onto this journey. Welcome to the Who I Became podcast. Lieutenant Colonel Dave Grossman, thank you for joining me today. Hello, Simon. Just Dave. Dave works real good. Dave, I'm, I'm honored okay. to be on board with you. You know, I, I always try to in, open the podcast. I, I retired from the Army 23 years ago, and I, I've been on 60 Minutes and 2020 and Larry King, and you know, I, I've done all of the big shows. And what I found out was none of them amount to a hill of beans. They cut it, and they only get a couple of minutes. They say what they want to say, and a week later, nobody cares. It's ancient history. We never truly had what I call citizen journalism. You know, we had uh, we had a handful of publishers. We had maybe maybe twelve national magazines, two city newspapers, three networks, and if you didn't go through them, you couldn't even remotely possibly have a national network. And now we got the podcast movement, and and I honor you for putting a podcast together because it will seek deeper layers of knowledge, and it'll be here a hundred years from now. And I honor those who listen because they're individuals who are seeking deeper knowledge, not just a five minute soundbite on, on TV. I, I'm so joyful to be part of this process and I'm honored to be on your show. Uh, you take a different angle from most people and I'm looking forward to it. Well, and, and Dave, one of the interesting things or what I like about it is it allows me to stalk people. So, you know, I mean, you know that I'm a, a former English detective, so I like to do my background, but it was fascinating when I was looking, you know, just sort of researching you online. And I've known and respected your work for around five or six yeah. years. You know, I emigrated from the UK um, in 2011 and sort of discovered some of your work and, and have been to a few events where you've been there. And there was things in your research that even I didn't know about you. But I mean, you know, you're an accomplished author, um, you know, um, on killing, on combat, assassination generation, bulletproof marriage. You know, you've just done a new book on spiritual combat. You know, former infantry, infantry officer, 23 years. You're an expert witness in the Timothy McVeigh um, prosecution case. You know, you've trained, if this statistic is right, in every state within the US to law enforcement. Um, you know, and, and really above all else, you're known for the psychology of killing. I think yeah. that the term that you could, um, is killology is what you've, you've um, created. So an amazing background. But I guess the first question is, what are you most proud of when you, when you listen to those accomplishments back? You know, I, I, I think it, it's the guy who looked at things deeper. You know, we, we, uh, I, I present to cops. I, I teach in, in over 100 universities and colleges. One of the things I tell people right up front is, you know, I, I'm, I'm the guest criminal justice speaker for the CJ program in a, in a university. I tell them the entire field of criminal justice is totally flawed. How, how do we measure crime and, and, and violence? Oh, the murder rate, wrong. The murder rate completely misrepresents the situation because medical technology holds down the murder rate. You know, we, uh, we had a study right around 2000. We had a study that says if we had 1970s medical technology, the murder rate would be three to four times what it is. So just between 1970 and 2000, we cut the murder rate to a third or quarter it would otherwise be. And, and, and we've gone on since then. One medical expert tells me that he believes tourniquets alone have cut the murder rate in half in just the last decade. Every cop carries a tourniquet now. 10 years ago, nobody carried a tourniquet. It's something came out of the war. Cop slaps on a tourniquet, saves a life, he's prevented a murder. In, these, in this violent nation with half a million cops on duty every day, if just, if just 20, 30 cops a day slap on a tourniquet, we cut the murder rate in half. Things are much, much worse than they look. And how can an entire field of academic endeavor be so fundamentally flawed? I, I was asked to brief the vice president uh, uh, last August in, in the White House. And I told him, I said, you know, we have, we have inflation adjusted dollars. We know if we compare money over any period of time, we're completely misrepresenting. If we don't allow for inflation, we need medically adjusted murders. So, I mean, to fundamental things like looking deeper, uh, other areas in my books, which we're able to dig a layer deeper and, and see things other people didn't see, the study of killing the resistance to killing and how we overcame that resistance. 
you know, and, and, and training people about combat. How in the world could we have had 500 years of gunpowder combat and not let people know the shots are probably get muted? So all my books are about digging in a layer deeper, uh, understanding things that once you hear them, they're obvious. Why didn't anybody teach this before? 500 years of gunpowder combat and nobody did us the least little bit to prepare for what's going on. So I, I think I, I want to be remembered as the guy who saw things deeper, who who dug a layer deeper in things and, and was able to give people a deeper level of knowledge. And, and that knowledge, like the resistance to killing, how we overcome that resistance to killing, has immediate impact on, on how we can raise our kids and, and, and raise the next generation and what's going on worldwide. So that's, that's, that's my, my goal in life, to just be the guy that looked at things a little bit deeper. Yeah, and so when you retired in 1990, I believe it was, um, what led you on to this journey? I know when I hear you yeah. speak, you know, you make this joke that you've been on the road for 20 years, but you generally have. I mean, what was, what made you wake up one day and say, I'm going to go on the road yeah. pretty much 360 days a year. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm going to go and educate. What, what led to that event? Well, you know, um, um, the story really begins in 1974 when a young private Grossman uh, showed up at the 82nd Airborne Division. And we were the America's elite unit ready to punch out anywhere. My war was the Cold War, 74 to 98. Uh, uh, the Russians never came across the border. We won. The, the price of war is too high. And our greatest achievement was the war that didn't happen. I tell my folks today, the current enemy cannot be deterred. The Russians were deterred. The price of war is too high. Our current enemy cannot be deterred. It's a different kind of war. But we had Vietnam veterans all around us. And we wanted to know what combat was like. And they wouldn't say. And, and it was just incredibly frustrating. And so, uh, you know, fast forward, I'm a young infantry captain now, OCS grad, Army Ranger. Uh, and uh, and, and I'm, I'm en route to teaching at West Point. And I did my research on killing. And, uh, and, and it ultimately came my book on killing. Not, not, I, call it, uh, I call it killology, not homicidology, but lawful killing. And all of a sudden, you know, if, if, if a friend or, or somebody you didn't know walks up and asks about your sex life, hey, man, how's the sex life going? How are the wife doing? How many times a week? It took away. But some scholarly researcher deeking, you know, with, with credentials, seeking information on a, on a, on a and, and all of a sudden, you know, you might think about it entirely differently. When a scholar is doing an anonymous survey on sex, you might look at it differently. So here's this this young infantry captain interviewing World War II veterans, and they would tell me things that they'd never told anybody before, how they responded to killing. And it was a, a weird process. I, I had early drafts of the manuscript, and, and veteran, Vietnam veterans' wives would say, I, I want to read the draft. And then they gave a copy to the husband and said, it's just what it was like for you. He said, let me read the book and I'll tell you. And, and, and so we had this, this dynamic and, and I really, it was 1988 that I went into grad school. It was 1995 that the book on killing came out. It, it took a long time, but it, it became this definitive book that covered this resistance to killing and how we overcome that resistance with training. And oh, by the way, the video games are doing the exact same thing to our kids. And that's another whole topic, but the book on killing sold over half a million copies in, America, in English alone translated into eight languages. Google Scholar says it's been cited over 2,800 times in scholarly works, one of the definitive books of our time. But I quickly realized that it was just the beginning. i peeling away layers of the onion because you were right. Here it was, uh, December 97, uh, uh, January 98, I'm getting out. And my, my wife and I had asked ourselves a question. The Army had offered me a couple of good jobs Clinton was president, the Cold War was over, and, and we asked ourselves, how can we best take the gifts we've been given to do the most good to the most people? When we looked at it that way, doing these presentations were obvious. I, and, I, and my book was out, and, uh, on killing was already out. I was training military and law enforcement worldwide. And we knew this is where God wanted us to be. When he asked that question, how can we best use the gifts we've been given to do the most good? it really becomes kind of obvious. And so uh, we got out and, and I was training law enforcement. 
And, and it, prior to 9-11, the only people in combat every day were police. The only people in life and death events every day was law enforcement. And, and like I said, my war was a cold war. You know, we, the military between wars is like a football team that never plays a game. But the law enforcement, they, were, they had what I call the daily acid test. If something's stupid, it gets you killed and you stop doing it. If something works, it sustains itself. So here I am now, all of a sudden, I'm teaching cops in all 50 states, all the federal agencies, and my presentation completely evolved. On Killing is good, the book is interesting, but it really isn't the heart of the matter. What really is the heart of combat is slow motion time and tunnel vision. The fact that you, the shots become muted, the memory gaps and memory distortions, and especially the thing that happened after the event. You re-experience the event that is not PTSD, it's normal. It can become PTSD, especially if you haven't been warned. So my son goes to his first combat tour, the invasion of Afghanistan, he's now got nine combat tours. But the book I literally wrote for my kid going into the fight, early edition of On Combat. If for anybody going to life and death event, On Combat's what we recommend. Just had an email from a, uh, a nurse who told me how important on combat was to her right now as she's going through the, 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 the COVID uh, 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 dynamic of these patients, things beyond what she's normally experienced. She thought she was gonna read on combat. It's been recommended around the medical world. The ER docs are recommending it. She said she thought it would be something that would help her escape. In reality, it was essential. It was pointed right at her performance under stress. So, you know, on combat's out there and I realized there was one more layer to the onion. Now, my book, Assassination Generation, I gave a copy to the vice president. I gave a copy to the president after the Parkland massacre. I was invited to brief, go to the White House as part of the president's roundtable on violent video games. And, and that's important. But the heart of the matter is my last book, which is on spiritual combat. Because in the end, we're facing a battle against forces of evil. And, you know, for 23 years, working with military, law enforcement, first responders, they will tell you that they have looked in the face of evil. They will tell you there can be no doubt in their minds that there is evil in this world. And if you believe in evil and you don't believe in a force for good on your side, then you're doomed. And the final step in the equation, the, 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 as you peel away the layers of the onion, the pearl that lies at the middle of it is preparing for the spiritual battle. And, and, and if, you, if you know there's evil in the world, but you don't know of a, a superior force of good on your side, then you're doomed to bitterness and despair, destruction. The world gives us two choices. Life is hard, then you die, right? Life is a dirt sandwich. Every day you gotta take one more bite. That, that's what the world tells us. God tells us to live as Christ and to die is gain. To live is joyful. God wants us to thrive. He has given us a life of love and joy and peace. He desires for us to thrive. To live is to be in Christ, and to die is even better. So take your choice. Which one are you going to go? Life is hard, then you die. To live is Christ, and to die is gain. Even if we're wrong, even if there is no God, we still come out ahead. If there is a God, then we, 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 we gain everything. And I tell people, you know, that 95% that of the universe is dark energy and dark matter. What, what, what is that 95% of the universe? We don't know. And people think, oh, I'm a person of science, baby. And, you know, science has got to prove this stuff. No, no. Belief is a choice. Yeah, you know, there's 95% of the universe out there. Could dark matter be heaven? Could dark energy be the angels? We don't know. The point is this. Belief is a choice, and you have the choice to believe in God and to reap all the benefits that come with that. So, you know, I, I've gone on a nice long ride. I'm 63 years old. It's my prayer I can do this for another for another 20 years. But now that i got this book done, I tell people, when God can take me home tomorrow, I, I pray I can do this. Come join me in one of my presentations. We're doing a lot more video stuff now. Uh, but, but if he takes me home tomorrow, I, I couldn't complain. You know, and if I get there first, I'll save you a place by the fire. Yes, please. Oh, uh, and, and there's one thing that I would say to you is that one of the books that you didn't mention, um, which I really wanted to talk about, um, because anytime uh, someone 
puts a book out there on marriage, there's, there's always questions for, for, for youngsters like me as to how do you stay the course. And I know your your um, uh, the book is called The Bulletproof Marriage, The 90 Day Devotional. Yeah. So with you spending so long on the road and clearly your wife has been involved in, in that decision, yeah. how does Dave Grossman maintain a bulletproof marriage when yeah. he's spending so much time away from home? Well, you know, I, I tell all my audiences, waiting at home for me, is my bride of 44 years. Sister Lyle will be 45 years. Wow. She, she was my high school sweetheart. She truly was. She truly was 15. I was 17 when I proposed to her. We tell people we are from Arkansas. And uh, two years later, she married a crazy army paratrooper. Been in this ride with me almost 45 years now. I love her more than life itself. But I've been on the road truly somewhere between two and 300 days a year for the last 23 years. I get home one, maybe two nights a week, uh, conjugal visit, clean underwear, back on the road. Because the only people on earth more precious than my bride are my grandchildren. And we believe if we love our children, if we love our grandchildren, if we love our nation, if we love our God, we'll walk out that door and give 100%. You know, uh, uh, the thing about love is the worse it gets, the more determined you are to give it all you've got. The, the most powerful motivation on the planet. Do you love your children? Do you love your nation? Do you love your God? And that, that should motivate you to walk out that door and give everything you got. It's my prayer I can keep doing this into my 80s. I think you get a lot of cool points during your 60s, 70s, even better, man. In the 80s, you got lots of points there. And it's my prayer I can keep doing it. Every day I have the health, and I've been blessed with extremely good health. And every day that somebody wants to hear what I got to give, I got to walk out that door and do it. And in the end, we both believe that... Uh, that we store up our treasures in heaven. Now, this time, this we're now in about 50, 60 days of the, of the quarantine. I've been at home with my bride for the longest time in our lives. We found out we really do like each other. You do like each other, yeah. I was gonna say. But That's let, not even you, don't tell but, me there's a divorce now after 45 yeah. years. Yeah. But let me tell you how we've sustained it. You ask a really important question. We've evolved a prayer life and every night, when I'm at home, when I'm on the road, I, I, I pray for my bride. I was, uh, I was a, a, a young, young uh, uh, spec ops warrior had picked me up and was driving me. It was late at night, my, my, my flight came in, he picked me up and drove me to the hotel. I'd be training his unit the next day. And, and it was on the West Coast, so my wife was going to bed early, right, early for our time. And, and I just turned away from that young, young warrior and, and I, 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 I prayed for my wife. And I was done, and he said, that's beautiful. You pray for your wife like that every night? I said, yeah, and she prays for me. God's word says that whenever two or more of you come to him, there's special power in those prayers. You should have a prayer partner with your bride. And I tell you the prayer that I pray for my wife every night. It's evolved over time. It changes. But dear God, thank you for all the blessings this day. And thank you for my dear love, darling Jeannie. Now, please bless and watch over and protect my Jeannie. Bless this girl with the best of blessings. Keep a host of angels around this woman to bless and protect. Fill her life with love and joy and great peace to be given and received to flow like a river through her life. Give her great health and happiness and prosperity. Bless her home and bless her loved ones. And then I mention all of her brothers and sisters. I mention all of her children. I mention all of our grandchildren. And, and I pray for our grandchildren and their education and their careers and their, and, 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 and their spouses and children yet to come. And then I pray that my Gina have a good night's sleep and sweet dreams and a wonderful day tomorrow. And then she prays for me. And you know, it's an amazing thing. When you hold hands and pray, when you talk over the phone and pray, all the little bitterness, all the little things that well up, they're gone. Like God just takes them out of your life. The ability to have patience. My wife has been ill through this time. She's got an injured foot. She hasn't been able to walk much. I've been tended to her. And she said, it's, it's amazing that throughout all this time, you've had this patience. You've helped me. You've never lost patience. I got to tell her that really came from God, you know, because we, we get the joy and we, we give him the glory. We give the, I prayed for it. I prayed for it. This is going to be a test of our marriage, Lord. This is going to be a time when I've got to have patience to help her daily, to be there in her in her, in, her, in her sickness, to, to have patience every day, to care for her, to tend to her. And, and if you pray for it, God will give it to you. And so I, I tell you that the answer to your question is three letters, 
G-O-D, God. Uh, and, and I really believe. And you know, when I talk about God in the in our book on spiritual combat, I talk about being God's sheepdog. You know, and, and I talk about the fact that uh, you know, I, I know that we're adopted in God's family. I know that Jesus paid a terrible price for us to be able to stand before the Father with our head up and look him eye to eye. And somebody won't be there. But right now, just being God's faithful sheepdog is, is all I can handle. You know, and, and, and we love God, dogs because they love us. And, and, and that's all they have to give us is their love and their loyalty. And we love God, and that's all we have to give, and that's all he asks. And you know, dogs are a great model for loyalty and courage in so many ways, but you know, they lick inappropriate parts of their body at the wrong time. Their, their sexual habits are not even remotely a good model for us. But we know that, and we still love them, and we forgive those things. And God knows our limitations. God knows our failures, and he still loves us. And we wrap up the book by saying, someday the sheep dog will finally rest at the feet of the great shepherd. We yearn to hear those words. Well done, the good and faithful servant. So that's my, 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 my route. Yeah. I, I pray to be a better person every day. I pray to be there for my bride. We hold it up in prayer. And you just, you just can't sustain anger and bitterness when, you, when you pray for each other every night. There must be a lot of men that listen to that and they're thinking, "Wow, that's a that's a, that's a model to um to follow." But it, it is it is a true model, and you know, as you say, life is never easy, but you have to sort of remain on the straight course. So thanks for yeah. sharing. And yeah. you know, one of the things that fascinated um, me about you the first time I met you was um, I'm trying to think of a nice word to say this, but your your mm. deep. Um, yeah, maybe not hatred, but your um, distaste of video games and how yeah. they change our youth. And I was sent you um, early, you know, my, my eldest son is yeah. nine, yeah. but the latest game is Fortnite. And my wife is concerned. He's addicted. I see it as just a young boy that's perhaps doing what boys do, um, you know, but he is he's really into the, the sort of the violence that comes with that game. And I know um, it correlates to your background because, you know, yeah. deadly force is deadly yeah. force and, and the archaeology yeah. that you have. But wh where did your sort of love or, or desire and passion come from in around sort of video yeah. games and yeah. violence? Well, you know, in my book on killing, at the end of on killing, I talk about, by the way, the video games do the same thing to our kids. And, and I couldn't deny it. I had to admit what I had done with my children was wrong. I, I'm embarrassed. I'm ashamed of some of the movies I let them watch and things I let them do. You know, Psalm 11 says God hates lovers of violence. You know, the opposite of love is not hate. And and there are times when when God tells us we should hate. And and, and uh, you know, and, and, and one of my life verses is, is Amos 5:15. It's very simple. Hate evil, love good, maintain justice. Poof. There it is. God's guidance for us. But he tells us to hate evil. And, uh, and uh, the, the thing to understand is, is Psalm 11 says that God hates lovers of violence. If I love that violent movie, if I love that violent video game so much, I can't protect my children from it. Who would I really worship? The thing about Fortnite is it's a T-rated game. Nobody knows that. You know, I, I testified, you know, the, the president. Honestly, I don't even know what T-rated no, means. Yeah, they've got my rating. Oldest no, nobody knows. The T means 13 above only. Okay. The people who made the game say that. And in my book, Assassination Generation, I talk about that the, the state of California overwhelmingly voted to regulate children's access to violent video games. You know, there's so many things adults can do, but kids can't. Tobacco, alcohol, pornography, sex, drugs, automobiles, firearms, all those things we say adults can have, but kids can't. So the state of California overwhelmingly voted to regulate children's access to violent video games. The home of Hollywood, the home of Silicon Valley, the data was overwhelming. Arnold Schwarzenegger signed the bill. Governor Schwarzenegger said, I make violent movies, I protect my children from them, and I particularly want to protect them from these, these murder simulators, these violent video games where they actually act out the process of inflicting death and violence. And the video game industry fought all the way to the Supreme Court with vast amounts of money. They said, we have the right to sell any game to any child at any age. You cannot stop us. You cannot regulate us any way, shape, or form. 
It's in the book, Assassination Generation. So, like, listen to the book, you know. And and uh, and, and and they conned the Supreme Court. They conned a bunch of old men of the Supreme Court in overturning the California law. All that's in the book, Assassination Generation. So what we're saying is, there's things that 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 adults can do, but kids can't. And it's a bare minimum enforce the rating. So they told the Supreme Court, we have a rating system, and you don't even know it, do you? They, they, they told the president, I mean, the President's Roundtable at the Parkland School Massacre. They said, well, we have a rating system, and we, we encourage people to enforce the rating system. It's a lie. You didn't even know what the rating was. Does the game come on? So boom, this is a, a, a T-rated game, 13 above only, should play this game? No. They lied, they deceived to sell these things to the youngest child at any age. And so they just recognize that the minimum standards enforce their own rating systems. Games like Halo and, uh, and GoldenEye and, uh, and, and Call of Duty, those are M-rated games, 17 and above only. M stands for mature. Every kid thinks he's mature. I'm mature, Dad. You said I'm mature. I can play a mature game. All right, you can play the game. It's, it's a deception to take the most horrific, violent games, give them a label, mature, that makes them desirable in the eyes of children. Uh, this, this industry at, at the corporate level, at the, at the international level, and it's in my book, Assassination Generation, they're evil. Their actions are evil, the things, that, and we have the brain scan study. We can show you the brain scans in my book, Assassination. Here's your kid's brain, here's your kid's brain on video games. When violent visual imagery is inflicted upon children, their body treats it like it's real. We can show you the impact. Adults can handle this stuff, kids can't. And the primary thing these games are doing is raising a generation of vicious little bullies. So everybody played toy guns. You know, bang, bang, I got you. No, you didn't. You smack him with your cap gun, it leaves a mark and he cries. Everybody gather around the hurt kid and try to convince him not to tell mom. Somebody gets hurt and the play stops. Basketball game, football game. One of the players gets hurt, the play stops. In a video game, you blow your playmates' heads off and explosion the blood, they beg for mercy. And you, and, and you inflict horrible suffering upon them. Does the play stop? You get points. This is pathological play. This is dysfunctional play. And one of the things we're facing worldwide is an epidemic of bullying. And the social media empowers bullying. You would never say these things to a person face to face, but you text message them evil, horrible things. And then the sleep deprivation that comes with it. They go to bed ramped up, their heart is pounding, they're filled with the blue light coming off the screen. Uh, the video games are addictive, the cell phones are text messaging all night long. And the sleep deprivation with these children is horrendous. In the military, we study our suicides intensely. And we know that a sleep deprived soldier can be up to five times more likely to take the life. Worldwide, suicides have exploded, teen suicides have exploded, teenagers. Now, between age 10, 11, 12, you know, tween age girls' suicide rate in America has tripled per capita in just the last decade. And the new factor is sleep deprivation. Again, a sleep deprived soldier is up to five times more likely to take his life. In the military, suicide has nothing to do with combat. A non combat vet is just like to take the life as a non combat vet. So, sleep deprivation creates traffic deaths and suicides, two major killers for our kids that have exploded. So, Here's parenting 101 for the 21st century. When you send your kid to bed at night, take their cell phone away from them. No cell phone in the room, no laptop in the room. They got to go to the room and sleep. A cop came up to me during a break in a presentation. He said, I had a good girl. He said, she was an A student. She said, Dad, it's embarrassing. You don't have to take my cell phone every night. You can trust me. He said, so I trust her. Let her keep her cell phone. A little while later, she took her life. He said, my little girl took her life. And we never knew the hell she was living in until we looked at the text messages on her cell phone. Night after night of ceaseless, relentless, vicious bullying. And you can't just ignore that stuff. We're not wired that way. She's up all night long trying to defend herself, trying to find somebody to stand up for. He said, I understood my little girl's bullied to death. What I didn't understand until now she was tormented, sleep deprived, and bullied to death in front of my eyes, and I let it happen. He said, I can't ignore that text message in the middle of the night. How can we expect our children to? So, and, and finally, not every 
every kid that has access to a gun commits a murder. But all the kids who commit these murders got access to a gun. Not every kid that plays video games becomes a killer. But all of the killers played these video games. They were not all on psychotropic drugs. That's a myth. FBI study had 19 school killers. Two, maybe three of the 19 mass murders were, were prescribed antidepressants. One case, God, God himself couldn't get access to the medical records. How do people claim to know, oh yeah, they're all on psychotropic drugs? How do you even know that? It's a lie. Had, the one thing they all have in common is, is these games. So they might learn fear. They'll be in a fight or flight mode in their brain. They might be more likely to bully. They might be sleep deprived. And they might be a killer. But we can yeah, protect and I, them. Yeah. And I'm no model parent by, by any means. But you know what I try and do is make sure my, my son understands it's real. And actually, I mentioned you um, by name the other day to yeah. him. So you, I'm starting oh, young oh, with him. Uh, but, you know, what I said to him is that these games, particularly Fortnite, but my some plays is, you know, you're not designed to ever win the game or beat the game. There's always a new add-on. There's always a new season. There's always a new gun, something else to have, you know. So I just tried to make it real that he understands it. And my, I believe my son does yeah. does understand it. When you shoot someone, they don't come back yeah, in real yeah. life, you know. So it is a And, and you've got to limit the time. Anything more than about an hour a day becomes very counterproductive. If you're going to do it, you have to strictly enforce the rating yeah, system. Yeah. Tell, tell him, tell him, <laughs> strictly enforce the rating system and limit the time because he becomes obsessive behavior. And you know, our little grandson, he's a high school graduate now. He just graduated from high school, class of 2020. You know, one of the best memes out there is a class of 2020, absolute masters of senior skip day, right? Yeah. But my grandson, as he was growing up, he'd be playing a game and then he had to stop. And we said, look at you, look at how you're acting. That's not normal. That's not you. That's the game. And having to stop that game is causing that. And so, you know, he'd stop playing and then he'd start playing again. And then we'd see this behavior and we'd say, stop, look at yourself. See what's happening right now. That's not you. That's yeah, the game. That's yeah. the game. And, and, and the person who you are right now is not you. We make you stop that game and, and you're like this. Something's wrong. And, and, and you're a good person. The problem is the games. You know, and and if, if you can't turn it off without having an attitude, then we need to think about what's happening yeah. here. I think we're going to stop here because me and other parents, <laughs> we're, we're, we're now thinking this is, yeah. this yeah. is bad, but it is, it is yeah. a challenge. But it, it's good to hear your passion on the subject. Yeah. You know, you, you're a man with, with grandkids. And I'll tell you one other thing, um, David, I can yeah. remember. Yeah. And I, I tested myself with this um, to you earlier, and I seem to get it right. But it was amazing how you impacted my life when I heard you say once, and hopefully I can get this right, that the greatest love um, is not often to give your life in sacrifice, but is to live a life of sacrifice. And I might have butchered it somewhat, but yeah. I remember you saying that, and it was really impactful in my life and still to this day like i said i can pretty yeah. much 98 percent recite yeah. it so so maybe just rephrase that yeah. in the correct way and then tell us about where, where did that come from well you know what i uh in my class i i and in my book on spiritual combat i i mentioned a police officer uh on 9 11 coming down for the world trade center his name is christopher amoroso and it's an amazing photograph. I've gotten permission from the photographer to use this photograph worldwide. He's carrying this pregnant woman down on his second trip down for the World Trade Center. Now, on, on the other side of the head, there's a bad cut. And we know he's been burned. He's exhausted. And the lady's face is beet red. Now, if you have a light complexion, it happens to everybody. You've got a light complexion and you a lot of vigorous exercise. Your face is flushed. Every blood vessel is wide open but his face is bone white. Uh, again, another light complexion, you could see it happening. And, and that's called vasoconstriction. And what we can tell you about that is it, faced with a tremendous stress, uh, danger, uh, the body shuts down the blood flow to the outer layer of the body. Uh, if he, his body, her, their heart rate could be exactly the same. The impact on the body is exactly the opposite. And what we can tell you about him is there's no rational thought that man's head. I tell people, go online, just Google Christopher Amoroso, 9-11, and the photograph will come up. It's, it's an iconic photograph. I ask people, what's different between him and her? 
He said, he's going back. He said, do you understand? There's no rational thought that man said. Do you understand nobody told him to go? People tried to stop him. He's been cut. He's been burned. He's exhausted. His eyes are rolled up in his head. Like a mother who races in a burning building to rescue a, a, a beloved child, he has to physically shrug people off to go back up that building a fourth time. The building will fall, and Christopher Amoroso will not come home to his wife and baby tonight. Never come home again. So why does one person go towards their death again and again while thousands are running away? And here's what we know. Uh, in nature, the, the one place where we see the natural instinct of self-preservation is to overcome consistently is a mama critter, a mama critter in many different species who die for one thing. What is it? Her babies, her young. Yeah. In combat, we know the thing that motivates people to hang in there in combat is their love for their comrades, their trust for each other. Uh, you put a bunch of strangers in front lines that don't know each other, don't care about each other. As soon as it's dark, as soon as people are dying, they're out of there. You put together a band of brothers and sisters and know and trust one another, they'll fight long and hard. Why? For each other. Audie Murphy was the most decorated American soldier in World War II. Audie Murphy has asked one time why he did it. His answer was very simple. They were killing my friends. They were killing my friends. All this research revolves around one word, love. The mama critter loves her babies more than life itself. Audie Murphy loved his fellow soldiers more than life itself. And Christopher Amoroso loved his fellow citizens, men and women trapped in those towers, men and women he's never met more than life itself. Now, here's the crazy part. You know, we have the Sheepdog Kids book. And it's a pretty important book. The Sheepdogs uh, Meet Our Nation's Heroes Kids book. But we say in the kids book, the sheep will die to protect the ones they love. Only the sheepdog loves enough to die for other people's love. It's only the sheepdog, and I add in, in my latest book, and the great shepherd, love enough to die for other people's loved ones. But we wrap it up by saying, you know, our sheepdogs out there, they're not heroes because they die. They're heroes because they walk out the door and lay their life down, and put their life on the line every day. Sometimes the greatest love is not to sacrifice your life, but to live a life of sacrifice. To do a dirty, thankless job every day of your life to the utmost of your ability because you know if nobody did it, our civilization would no longer exist. Not to sacrifice your life, but to live a life of sacrifice. For most of us, therein lies the greatest love. And, and the crazy thing about it, I say in the book on spiritual combat, about Christopher Amoroso. I'd used him for the first decade after 9 11 as a model of sacrificial love. And somebody said, look up what the name Amoroso means. Amor is love. Amoroso is the lover, one who loves. Then somebody said, really look up what that name Christopher means. A lot of people know Christopher means Christ bearer, but very few people know the original story. Uh, in the early days of the church, there was a man who came to the Lord and his, his ministry, his, his service to God. He was a big man, Christopher Amoroso was a giant of a man. And he would carry people on his back across a river where people were perishing. And the story has it that he carried a child on his back. And the weight in his back grew heavier and heavier. He had the weight of the world on his back. He could barely crawl out the other side. And he had Jesus on his back. And the word Christopher means Christ bearer. And the moral of the story is, as you carried that child on your back, you carried me. As you have done unto the least of these, it done unto me. Christopher Amoroso, Christ bearer, the lover. Christopher Amoroso, carrying that pregnant woman or unborn child down for the World Trade Center. Christopher Amoroso, Christ bearer, the lover, who will turn around and go back up that building one more time and die for just a remote chance of saving one more life. Where was God on 9-11? I think wherever you see sacrificial love, you're looking through a glass darkly in the face of God. 
And it's amazing when I heard you tell, I'm getting goosebumps as you're, as you're saying that, um, Dave, but you know, when I heard you say that, I didn't even know some of that backstory to it. It just yeah. reinforces yeah. why did I remember that one line? Yeah. Um, and it's, it's very, very powerful. And, and an interesting um, uh, subject I sort of want to move on to. Yeah. And a lot of it is about, you know, you most probably shouldn't even be talking to me. I mean, you're, you're an acclaimed author. You know, you've met the yeah. president. Some yeah. of your books are on the required reading list at West Point. You know, you've gone to all these states. Like I said, why yeah. are you even talking to, to this English guy in Minnesota? Oh, I'm, love, I'm honored <laughs> to be able to do it. It truly not, is an honor. But I'm pleased that you are. But so, you know, there, there's been a lot of accolades. There's been a lot of things that have gone right in your career. When when you look back, what's your biggest learning where something might yeah. not have gone right or you thought, yeah. I would do that differently if I was here you again? No, I'll tell you in all honesty. Last August, I had the chance to brief the vice president. He took a photograph, signed a letter, sent it back to me. We got it on the wall. But he wanted me to come and brief him about the violent video games. And I gave him a copy of my book, Assassination Generation. But I thought I would have 30 minutes to turn on the fire hose. See, for, for 23 years, I've been teaching people. And I thought I would have a 30-minute presentation, and I had a chance to, to tell him the key points that I thought were critical beyond just the book. And, and, and it was the single greatest failure of my life. I mean, it was good. He got the information. But a, a person like that, you, you're, you're not, they're, they're going to control what they hear. And, and a briefing to a person in power, they have they have limited time. And when you do a briefing to a person in power like that, you gotta you gotta completely change it. So you know it worked out fine. But if I could go back and do one thing different in my life, that would be the one. You know, I uh, I speak at the NRA every year. I I, uh, I believe that sheepdogs should have the right to protect their loved ones, and I and I justify that in many ways. But the anti-gun folks don't like me much for that. I train cops in all fifty states, and uh, some of the the cop haters don't like that, you know, and of course the video game industry, they're not very happy and that's an incredibly powerful and wealthy industry. And, and all of them have to one degree or another tried to shut me down and I think they're intensely frustrated that they haven't had any success. And, and I just keep plugging along, doing what I do decade after decade and at the end, you know, uh, uh, you know, I tell all of my first responders, all of my security people, all of my military, Nobody is doing this job for the money. If your goal in life was to be filthy, stinking rich, you're in the wrong business. At you least don't join legally. the federal government yeah. or the law it? enforcement yeah. or, or and, crime and investigations. If, if your goal in life is to be a famous celebrity, you know, you're in the wrong place in the wrong time. When you chose to be a sheepdog, you chose a life of sacrifice. And you must believe your sacrifice is for a noble and worthy purpose. And, and, and in the end, we store up our riches in heaven. All this stuff on earth, the, the coins, the, all of those things. I love being able to, to backdrop. All those are gifts that were given to me. And they're nothing. All the coins, I've got probably, and that's just one quarter of the coins on the wall. Uh, and, and half the coins, we didn't put in the wall anymore. I think I have the greatest collection of coins in private hands in, anywhere in the world. And they're nothing. They're wood, hay, and stubble. We throw them away because we store up our treasures in heaven. All this stuff can be gone tomorrow, and it means nothing because the eternal dynamics. When I write my book on spiritual combat, I tell people, please don't curse God when he doesn't answer your prayers the way you think he should. You know, in God's eyes, a few extra years on this world, less suffering on this world is nothing compared to eternity in heaven. And, and so we've got to understand it and take that long-term view of things. And, uh, and that's what the perfect pearl is. I feel the killing and then combat and then spiritual combat. And God and, and spiritual warfare is what lie at the heart of the matter. The battle for the survival of our civilization, our family, our, our way of life is being fought every day. And it's a spiritual battle. And we've got to drop on spiritual resources. And I tell you what, if there was a God, he wouldn't be hiding under a rock somewhere. If just you and a handful of other peoples really know the truth, and you've got an awful weak God, I wasn't able to communicate the truth to everybody throughout all these thousands of years. If there's a God, he would have his word in every hotel room in the land. If there was a God, he'd have his houses of worship in every city, every town around the world. And, uh, and he would give prosperity to his people. And there's only one capital G God uh, that any right, reasonable-minded person would, would accept. 
uh, if a reasonable test of, of, of who's in charge of our, of our, of our lives and our universe. And uh, that's the great shepherd. Now, right now I'm just a lowly little sheep dog licking inappropriate parts of my body, but he forgives us, you know, uh, all I have well, to give him is my love. And, uh, you, and all, you are a complete, you're yeah. a complete character. Cool. Funny. But hey, I, I'm, one thing that just, as you were talking, came into my mind then, and I, I think we might have the mutual friend in Tina Rowe out in um, Colorado, a friend yeah. of Cole, Cole Chin's former uh, U.S. Um, marshal in Colorado, Tina Rowe. But people listening to the podcast won't see it, but the video will. But behind me is my, what I call my, or what Tina calls my wall of look at me. Yeah. And I see yeah. that you've got one behind yeah. you as well. And, yeah. you know, I don't have the career that you did, but I spent 14 years in, in yeah. law enforcement in the UK yeah. investigating. And you've got things crime. behind you as well. You know, it, well, it's important. Now, here's the key. We have got to be our own cheerleader. I tell every cop, start a scrapbook. <laughs> Put all the, start a scrapbook. Put this stuff up on the walls. The world will try to pull you down. You have to be your own cheerleader. That, that but in true. the end... Yeah, in the end, the stuff behind you, the stuff behind me, we, we, we lay all that down at the altar. We lay that at the feet of, of, of God, of knowing that, that the rewards he gives us is far greater than anything this world can do. Well, that nine-year-old that I, um, I, I said my oldest son, my youngest is six, and I said, you know, one of them is going to have to have all my police memorabilia and police yes, yes. sort of tat, as we say. And they will, and the other, it. They will love yeah, it. Well, I hope so. We, we, we'll see. That will be part of a deal that they can't give yes. it away or throw it away. Or, but my, my question would want to be in relation to, you know, I'll look at me walls and our careers, yeah. you know, your yeah. uh, eclipse mine, but has anyone in your family following, followed in your footsteps? Well, you know, I've got a son with nine combat tours and uh, he's still in uh, uh, three bronze stars. And, uh, uh, you know, so he's followed that path. I've got a son who's a gunsmith, lives right next door, sheepdognifeandgun.com. You know, gun dealers nationwide are out of stock. We're, 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 you know, and they're not producing anymore. We keep producing. My son's over there knocking out four or five incredible guns every month. And they're, we're in stock, sheepdognifeandgun.com. And then my youngest son is a, is a champion rock climber. And, uh, and he works with a, a board game company, one of only two employees in the whole million dollar company. So, you know, uh, uh, I can live my life vicarious through my kids, you know, nine combat tours, uh, gunsmith and master gun guy, champion rock climber. Uh, I, I'm proud of them. They're good kids, and we want them to all follow their own path. Uh, it's a hard standard to follow, but they've all done great things, and I'm awful proud of them. And, you know, people have asked, you know, how did it turn out right? Because I, I was such a dummy, and I did so many bad things with my kids, and I'm ashamed of the things I let them see and the way I responded. And We can be better people. We keep being better people as we get older. But, you know, one thing I did with my kids is I, I read to them every night. I'd had jobs where I would come home at seven, eight o'clock every night, exhausted, working for over 12 hours in the military. But I always got there before bedtime and I would sit and read to them for a half an hour. And I read chapter books. I read the whole Narnia series, one chapter at a time. And this thing that psychologists call the, the rule of the last 30 minutes. Whatever you do in the last 30 minutes is what you're likely to dream about. We've all been at work and gone home and dreamed about work. You know? uh, but you can, you can plant a memory in their head. They can have a terrible day. And you take that last 30 minutes, you hold them in close. You read to them. I read to them right up until they're older teenagers. And, and read to them every night for 30 minutes. And, 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 and you, they're close and the sound of your voice and the closeness and the written word and the, and the stories in their mind. And, and, and that's the greatest gift in so many ways you can give our kids it, just to get that last 30 minutes right and put them to bed, tucked into bed with the sound of your voice and good words in their head. Uh, and and if, if I look back, the one thing I got right with those kids is choosing the right mother. I'll tell you what, I wasn't there. Uh, she's a hero. And, and spending that last 30 minutes of every day dedicated to talking to them and reading to them. And, and I don't mean just, you know, just a five minute little kid book. But going in detail and reading them, I read poetry to them. I read a lot of things to them. Uh, when they were little, they, they didn't have any control. As they got older, I'd read kids' books, but I read a lot of kids' books. And then, and then we read chapter books to them. And, uh, and just understand that the things we can put into their lives, the world can tear them apart. We can take that last half hour and own that last half hour. And then have them close up their day in prayer. We would pray and tuck them into bed and, uh, and, uh, 
And, and, and that's the recipe to having some kids that turned out okay in spite of all the stupid, dumb stuff I did. Yeah, and it's been really good talking to you today. And as I just hear, I mean, funny enough, I reckon it was six, seven months ago, I posted something on LinkedIn and someone said to me, do you know Lieutenant Colonel Dave Grossman? Because he has a similar opinion. I said, yeah. I don't, but we've got a lot of mutual friends. And at some yes. point, I yes. hope we're going we're gonna to meet. So it's been really um, an honor and a privilege for me to talk to you oh, over sorry. the last sort of 45 minutes. And and I hope for us, this isn't the end, but we can continue and, and get to know each other. So we're really grateful that you've taken the time to, to come and talk to me and, and, and share some uh, share a little bit about, about your life. Yes, yeah, my pleasure, my brother Sheep Darger, under the authority of the Great Shepherd. And you bring me back anytime you want to. It'd be my privilege. And, uh, and now, Dave, how can people get a hold of you for those well, who have not seen some research? I, I'm posting a lot on LinkedIn. I like LinkedIn. Uh, Facebook has all kinds of limitations. You can't talk about guns, can't talk about this. And uh, I, I, I put a lot on LinkedIn about what's going on. And we got a Facebook page. My, my website is killology.com, K I L L O L O G Y.com. I coined the term, not homicide, but the scholarly study of killing military and law enforcement and uh and the, and uh, so that website has a lot of my calendar and other things on it um, we also is contact directly to me and to my staff and we're, we're scheduling you know we're, we're beginning to do a lot more work we can really help people as we deal with the current times the the, the pandemic the talking to people with a mask on I, I do a class and part of the class is how to talk with a mask on the stress that's there how you begin to raise your voice when it can create counterproductive, how important your nonverbal gestures are. Well, I'm doing a lot of online teaching just like this. You know, I, I put my easel back here. I put an easel back there. I write on the easels just like my class. I talk to them. It's dynamic. I work them on through the class. And, and we talk about, you know, I, I'm, I'm teaching an insurance corporation. They've had, they've had almost 2,000 employees who are, uh, who, who are working from outside of home, they're still doing insurance adjusting. They're showing up to people in the moment of greatest need. They need to know what it's going to be like for a person who's been in this life and death event and how they can help them and give them the tools to deal with that. And while they're wearing a mask and you're wearing a mask, what are the some things you can do? So in, in my presentations, I teach businesses. I teach, uh, uh, I still do a lot of work with law enforcement. We're doing it from home. As we get to the end of the year, a lot of people have training budgets and training money to be used. And we're still able to do some great online courses for them and doing a lot of work. So, you know, God shuts one door and he opens the other door. And it would be my pleasure to be a service to any of the magnificent uh, men and women uh, and deep thinkers who have listened all the way through this podcast. And uh, uh, put me in, Coach. I'd, I'd be proud to be a service. Well, Lieutenant Dave Grossman, a pleasure to talk to you and speak to you soon. My pleasure, Simon. Thank you for joining us for the Who I Became podcast. If you are enjoying the discussions between Simon and his guests, make sure to subscribe, rate, and review, as well as share with your friends on social media. Once again, thank you for joining the Who I Became podcast.